God, and a blessing, Lord God, upon the family, Lord God. And I pray for a financial breakthrough, Lord God, for those, Lord God, that are in need of it, Lord. I pray just that you just continue just to be with us here in this, this church, Lord, and continue blessing, Lord. In Jesus' my name, I pray. Amen.
the parts we're about to read. So I pray that God would just allow you to take in the living word of God. And I pray it would do to you what it's done to me and more. <clears throat> and more. <clears throat> so, I'm going to be picking this up. Chapter uh, 13, verse 1. Now, in the, in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius, and Cyrene, Minion, uh, who, and, and Minion, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. The reason we go back and read that is because last week we didn't get to touch on some of the important things that we are about to touch, so we need that. So, Bible tells us in that church, in the early church, you read a list of people that are teachers, being used of God. Not just teachers, but prophets, right? Amen. amen. We need a little bit of amen tonight to make sure you're awake. Okay? To make sure you're I know it's Wednesday and we're tired, but let's fight for this, folks. Let's open up. Let's just stay in tune and let the Word of God do this uh, in your heart. So, there were prophets and teachers, and it gives a list of names. Now, not only is that important just to know, so that we know who God's using, because they're different people. But it's also important to know, because of what we're about to read in verse 2. So the Bible tells us that as they, as they minister to the Lord and fasted, and we talked a lot about that last week, how everything you do for the Lord, or everything you do in ministry is unto the Lord. And it's always ministry to people. And so always remember, love God, love people. When you're ministering to people, treat them well. Because the truth of the matter is, sometimes people can be, uh, you know, can, can, can get on your nerves, can frustrate you. Is that right? Yes. Amen. Isn't that normal? Yes. Right? In, a, in a real normal world, people aren't perfect and we're not always going to have perfect peace. There's going to be times where we're just going to rub each other the wrong way because that's just life. But you know, that makes it more powerful because that's when you know you're loving people because you look past those weaknesses and you look past those faults to find the need and to care about one another. That's a powerful way to love. Love gets tested when things don't go smooth. So, so as they minister, verse 2, to the Lord and fasted, there's a word that we're all familiar with right now. How many of you are fighting, pressing on in your fasting? Amen. I hope you are. Fasting and prayer, that's a powerful thing. Fa fasting is not, fasting is not meant to be this, this, uh, this thing that is just for us to get healthy. The result of fasting is you'll get healthy. But the purpose is a spiritual, spiritual one. And so, you see the New Testament church, they were fasting and praying. They regularly fasted and prayed. So some people say, why do we fast and pray? Because we believe what the Bible teaches. And when you see the New Testament church fasting and praying, when you remember Jesus said, right now when the, bride, when the, the bridegroom is here, the guests won't fast. But when he goes away, then they will fast. Pastor John, we are deceived tonight. Amen. Amen. May you Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> uh, we love you. We love your family. Love you too. So, we remember what Jesus said. He said, there will come a day where my people will fast. And now we're seeing it happening where they fasted and prayed. Then look what happens. Verse 2. As they visit ministry to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. First thing I want to point out to you is that the Holy Spirit said. If you look at the, what we're reading, you've got to ask this question. How did he say it? This is perfect proof that God still speaks to his church, to his people, and the living word of God that we read, it's powerful. But folks, there is the gift of gifts of the Spirit that are still functioning and flowing in the body of Christ. And here we see, we just got the reading that in the church, there were prophets and teachers. And they give a list of people. 
and showed us that for a reason. Because the very next verse tells us that as they're fasting and praying, the Holy Spirit said, and it doesn't say which one of the prophets spoke, which one was moving in the gift of prophecy. It doesn't say it. It doesn't give the person's name. Why? Because that's not important. How many know all glory goes to God? Yeah. When somebody's using the gifts of prophecy or speaking in tongues or, or uh, interpretation of tongues or gifts of healing or the, 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 the nine supernatural gifts that we read about in Scripture, that's never meant to, for anybody to walk around with a big head. You know, getting patted on the back because God's using us. The emphasis is not on the us. The emphasis is on God. Amen. 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 To God be the glory. Always. Something good happens in your life. To God be the glory. Amen. If you are in a battle, to God be the glory. Amen. Amen. And so, we see that in the early church, prophets and teachers being used of God. And as they ministered and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, and so what did he say? He said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. <coughs> Folks, the one thing I want to point out immediately right here is this is a great example of how ministers are raised up, how God calls people. This is a great way for us to understand it. It's not a work of the flesh. It's not a work of, of people. It's not a work of organizations. Some people think, yeah, I'll just go online and um, do the classes and become a pastor. And they'll send me the certificate. <coughs> who will send you the certificate? And who says because you passed a course that now you're a pastor or a preacher? Who said, whoever, when did with scripture says, oh, and, uh, and in the internet, you will get your anointing. <laughs> Doesn't work that way. The way it works is in God's timing and in His purpose when people are submitted to God, when they're ministering unto the Lord, when they're putting God first and surrender to God. In those times, God will call on His people. And how He calls on them is His prerogative. What He calls on them for is His purpose. For example, some of us, we're just serving God. We're just waiting on the Lord. We're not telling God, you got to excuse me. You got to do this. You got to do that. We're just loving God, serving God in any way we can do, in any way we can help. And in that, with that kind of heart, God will step in and touch you. Maybe even tap you on the shoulder and say, I want to separate you from my work of ministry. That's what he did here. It, the Holy Spirit said, separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. Don't think for a second the ministry that you're a part of or have ever been a part of or ever will be a part of. Don't think for a second that you've been called by man. Are you listening? Yes. You have not been called by man. You've been called by God, by the Holy Spirit. This is why we don't give up. This is why we continue, we press in to the best that God would give to us. Why? Because we weren't called by man. We can't say, hey God, I'm going to put you in, in um, kind of on a, a cruise control mode. We're going we're gonna to have you set stuff. I know you called me. I know you got me and wanted me to do something. But right now I'm not really wanting to do that. So, hey God, hang out for a bit. It's not how it works. And if you're able to do that, then you might be thinking the wrong way. You might be thinking that it's an organizational thing, that it's a, uh, a local church organizational thing. No, folks, it comes from God, the Holy Spirit. God said to you, separate from me this one and that one for my work. And it doesn't matter what the work is, because to God be the glory. If he separated you to sweep uh, the hallway, how many know when you got that group? You're singing to the Lord. You're praising God. Amen? Come on, Come on now. For me. Come on. Come on. Amen. What if, what, if, what if God said to you, uh, I'm going to call you to, to teach the children, go in there and teach them a Bible story, even if they're jumping around and don't want to pay attention to you? Come on. Come on. Well, I wouldn't do that because no one would see my giftings and my anointing, and then they would never know my potential. Your potential. Let me tell you about your potential and my potential. 
Our potential is under the mighty hand of God because without him, John 15 says, we can do nothing. Oh, nothing. Oh, my. Uh -huh. Let's do it again. Without him, we can do nothing. nothing. Man, tune in, guys. Get the antenna. So when the Holy Spirit sets you apart, it's for his work. And if he sets you apart, he should be the one to tell you when it's time to switch it, when it's changing direction, when it's time to, to uh, slow it down or speed it up, when it's time to make a left turn or a right turn, when it's time to make a U-turn. He should be the one to say, yes or no? Amen. Amen. But if you have called yourself, or if you have believed it as an organizational thing, then you make all the decisions. Hmm. The Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. One little detail there that I want to point out to you is you'll notice the, the name order. Every time you read in the scriptures where there's an, uh, a, a list of names, uh, it's, it's always, it's never... The opposite. It's never uh, not this. Is what I'm trying to say. It's always the order God places it. For example, here the Holy Spirit says, "Separate for me Barnabas and Saul," and He puts Barnabas first. But later on, as we read, we're going to notice that they change places, and it starts to become Paul and Barnabas. And you can see how the, the scripture follows and, and, and highlights Paul's ministry. Why? Because Paul becomes the leader. And so just a quick little something to learn. You're going to see how that's important. And it, it blows my mind because there's places in scripture where, where, where the Lord, uh, where the word of God will tell us. Uh, for example, does, it, does anybody remember a couple by the name of Priscilla and Aquila? Do you remember those names? Interesting. They're called out teachers. They were taught Apollos. They were teachers in the body. And what you see is Priscilla and Aquila. She was called first before him. You don't see that too, too often in Scripture. But why do you see it? Because there are times when God uses the sisters and in place to help, even maybe she even was able to teach her husband how to teach. It does happen. Yes, so when people tell you, oh, no, it's never that way. Read your Bible. All right, so Bar separate from me Barnabas and Saul for the word that I call Verse 3. Then having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them, and they sent them. They sent them, they sent them to the work. Uh, I, I forgot who I was talking to the other day. But we were talking about how ministry comes about. Well, you either are sent or you went. Do you understand the difference? Amen. You either were sent or you went. You're either a sent or you're just a went. Okay. What does that mean? That means that when the Holy Spirit's involved, you are sent. You're led by God. But when you make the decision on your own, you're just a win. You did it on your own. And that is an unhealthy thing to do. Doesn't mean God can't work with it. Doesn't mean God can't redirect it, forgive it, change it, work, uh, and even uh, make it fruitful. But I tell you, it is the best decision to wait on the Lord and be sent by God. Yes? Amen. Amen. Let's keep going. Verse 4. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit. Not by a man, not by a pastor, not by a ministry, by the Holy Spirit. What does it say? It says, uh, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, verse 4, they went down to Seleucia, and from there, they sailed to Cyprus. <coughs> Seleucia was about 16 miles from Antioch. It was a seaport city. Verse 5, and when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues. Everybody say synagogues. synagogues. Not synagogue, meaning one. Barnabas and, and Paul, they went to every single synagogue they could find. Multiple. What is a synagogue? It's the place where the Jews 
got together to worship God, the God of the Old Testament. And why is that important to know? Because it goes to show you something amazing. It shows you that God keeps his promises, that he gave the word first to the chosen people. He gave salvation first to his chosen people. First. And you see, the early church, God keeps his word. And so what did they do? In, um, in uh, Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John as their servant or their assistant. Now stop right there for a minute. John, this John that is speaking of, how many of you are still with me, by the way? Yes. Yes. I just want to make sure. You start, you should, if you start glazing over and then I'll go, okay, that's it. Can't handle it anymore. John, this is the John that we read about, John Mark. He is the nephew of Barnabas. And as we read this, you're going to see the details of why it's important to know it. Um, and so John Mark was taken by Barnabas and by Paul to, to go along with them in ministry. And the Bible says that he was their assistant or their servant. Now, when we think about a servant, we have to think about it in the terms of, of, of how they served in those days. Don't think of it like some butler, you know, nowadays, you know. Uh, don't think of it like it's the days of slavery. His, his heart was to be like sort of like an armor bearer, someone who would, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> someone who would fill in the gaps. Paul, Barnabas, they're doing ministry, and John was there to help make that ministry go well, assisting in any way possible. And he did it with his heart. Amen. Are you listening? Yeah. So that's what it means. They were, he was their assistant. Verse 6. Now when they had gone through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar Jesus. Before we go any further, this island, uh, as, you, as you study and try to figure out where it's located, uh, it's believed that it's this one island called Kitten. A kitty? A kitten? Kitten. And it's found in the Old Testament. For some of you, you're like, and that doesn't matter to you. But for someone who wants to know all the details, there it is. So uh, this island, as they passed through uh, by this island and they went to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew named Bar Jesus. Okay. Now here's what's happening. Paul, Barnabas and Paul. Barnabas is still the leader. He's leading the way. Uh, they're going. They're serving. And they're ministering in all the synagogues. And what they find is they find this one guy who's who's uh, connected and involved with some of the some leadership. Here, and I'll, and I'll give you some of that detail in a minute. And his name was Bar Jesus. This word Bar Jesus, you know what it means? It means son of Jesus. Son of Jesus. Mm. Now don't read that and get anywhere like this because he wasn't Jesus' son. Mm. Whoever named him and how, how they named him, why they named him, you know, could, maybe can reveal how old he was or he wasn't that old. Young enough or somebody could say, oh, I'm going to name him Son of Jesus. May not even be the Jesus, our Savior. Could be another Jesus because there's plenty of Jesus. But his name was Bar Jesus, verse 7. Well, hold on, verse 6. A false prophet, a Jew. So he is a false prophet, he is a Jew. Okay? But what else does it say? Uh, it says he's a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar Jesus, verse 7. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus. Okay? An intelligent man. He's an intelligent man that he's spending time with. Someone who, uh, a very wise, very intelligent, prudent man, uh, if you read out of the King James, goes on to say, this man, now, don't get confused, because now we're talking about two different guys. We're talking about Sergius Paulus and that false prophet Jew that is, his name is Bar Jesus. Okay? So the Bible says here in verse 7, This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. Which man? Well, we believe the, 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 the person who wanted to know 
about the Word of God was this intelligent man, Sergius Paulus. It could be this other guy, this false prophet, but by reading the whole thing, it doesn't appear to be that way. It doesn't seem to be that. Uh, so it goes on to say, they called for Barnabas, this man called for Barnabas and Saul, and sought to hear the Word of God. So they, they wanted to hear the Word of God spoken by Barnabas and Saul. They wanted to hear what this was all about. Who, what were they preaching? Okay, look and listen to what verse 8 says. But uh, El El Elimus, Elimus actually, Elimus the sorcerer, okay, don't get confused, this is not a second sorcerer. The Bible says this, for his name is translated. So Bar Jesus and Elimus are the same guy. Okay. Everybody follow? Yes. Uh, Amen. Yes. Okay. So, the Bible says that Elimus the sorcerer, for his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. We're going to stop right there for a minute. Here's what's going on. This false prophet, this Jew, he was being consulted uh, on a regular basis. He, he was at being asked for advice, asked for guidance, asked for direction. He placed himself as a prophet, but he was a false prophet. And this proconsul, Sergius Paulus, had him with him, and he would always sort of talk with him, get information from him, you know, sort of weigh out his wisdom and his knowledge. And so it's easy to see why once Barnabas and, and Paul started to preach, this false prophet, this sorcerer, so he's a, he's a false prophet, he's a Jew, uh, so he's not a, a Gentile. He's from the, the, the chosen people, but he's also a sorcerer. And this guy, when he hears the preaching, it's easy to see how maybe he says, wait a minute, I'm the guy you're supposed to be talking to. I'm the one you're supposed to be getting advice from. Don't be listening to these guys. But this guy, uh, Sergius Paulus, he was interested. He was intrigued by the word of God, by the words that were being spoken. It, it, it intrigued his spirit. And so he was listening intently. And when when this guy, Elias, when he realized that, the Bible says he, he, he came against him. Look what it says here. It says in verse 8, he withstood them and seek to turn the proconsul away from the faith. He tried to hinder him and keep him from believing. Folks, I'm here to tell you that there are still people like this. It's one thing to work around people or have family members who just don't believe and they tell you, ah, eh, whatever, if you want to do that, that's on you. It's one thing to have those people around you. It's a completely different thing when there's someone who literally is trying to keep you, trying to speak to you in such a way that would keep you away from believing in God. And there are people like that today. Maybe there's people who say, I don't want you to change. I don't want to lose my friend. I want my party buddy. I want to I wanna still be able to, to hang out. And if you go and get all religious on me, then you know you're gonna you're gonna blow it. You might say, I've been in church a long time, Pastor, but that doesn't happen to me anymore. It used to happen to me. That's one thing. That's one thing, folks. When, when we're preaching here, I know there's people here that you've been in church a long time, and so some things may not still happen to you. You may not have anybody around you that are party people. You may not. But here's the thing. God wants us to reach souls. Amen. Yes, amen. So let's, let's make something really clear. Yes, be careful who you hang around with. If you're weak in your faith, if you're weak, then you know. God and you know if you're weak. If every time a, a, a beer commercial comes on, your mouth starts watering, you you got a weakness. <laughs> you know? That's a good sign. Don't go hang out with people who are drinking. You're not ready for it. Come on. You know, you, you hear about somebody and they're getting high and they're partying and it's a temptation to you. It seems like fun. You, you got no business hanging around people like that. Because you're not ready for it. Because you know what's going to happen? 
They will influence you. You will not influence them. So be careful who you hang around with. But having said that, God wants us to win souls. And how do you win souls? How do you reach souls if all you hang around with are other believers? Come on. Come on, huh? How do you do it? If all you do is hang around other believers, if you can talk Christian talk, talk about the latest Christian song, and you know that sermon last week, and all of that. You know, it's a, it's a powerful thing to fellowship, and we need to fellowship. But remember the commission. God said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. To who? Well, folks, I'm already saved, so you don't need to preach the gospel to me. And I don't need to preach the gospel to you. We need to teach one another the word of God so we can grow and mature and get strong, but we don't need to try to save each other because the reality is you and I have already submitted our lives to God, right? Amen. So let me echo this one more time because I don't want anybody leaving here going, oh, see, pastor said I go hang around with the world. I can say that. And the Bible doesn't say that. Matter of fact, remember the book of James chapter 4? Being a friend of the world is an enemy to God. Being in friendship with the world is hostility towards God. Okay? It doesn't mean that when you go and read someone that's not saved yet, doesn't know the Lord yet, that you're being hostile towards God. You're doing the work of God. It means when you unite, when you unite yourself with what they're doing, when it becomes what you're doing. And I'll say it one more time. If the world can't recognize the difference between you and someone in the world, it's probably because there is no difference. Come on. We need to stand out. We need to rise up. And not in an arrogant way. Oh, I'm sorry, God. I'm saved. I'm on my way. Hey, what about you, dirty sinner? <laughs> we don't need to be that way. We need to recognize that if God strengthened us and we're ready to, to reach uh, you know, those people... You become all things to all people that you might save some. That's what Paul said. You love on them. Don't judge them. I got to say this. I got to say this. Too many Christians try to teach unbelievers how to live like Christians without telling them they need to be born again. Come on. Oh, don't listen to that music. It'll mess up your mind. Don't watch that TV. God doesn't like that. No, don't talk like that. Start cleaning up your, your language. You know what? Don't tell them any of Tell them, we need Jesus. Jesus came to die for our sins. We need to be born again. And when they believe and trust in God, then guess what happens, folks? Then they start to have a relationship with God, and the Holy Spirit starts to say, stop doing that. Don't be doing that. And the Holy Spirit starts to work that out. And that's a sign that you know somebody's been born again. Yes? No? Amen. Too many Christians are trying to teach unbelievers how to be like believers, you do that, you're going to create a Pharisee. And you remember what the Pharisees did. They were instrumental in putting Jesus on the cross. The very creator. Think about that. We don't want to be religious, and we don't want to create uh, disciples that are religious. We want to lead people to Christ. Amen. Like I said, kind of going off a little bit, but let's keep going. Oh, hallelujah. We got another hour. <laughs> See, that always wakes you. I notice a little giggle happens every time you wake up. Oh, I hope you didn't mean that. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So, there are always going to be people like this sorcerer guy who don't, don't want you to, to be close to the Lord. For whatever reasons. You don't accept that. Let no one stop you from going all the way with all your heart for the Lord. Don't let anybody convince you otherwise. So, <clears throat> Elias the sorcerer withstood Barnabas and Paul and sought to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Now listen to what it goes on to say, verse 9. And Saul, who also is called Paul, this is the first time in Scripture you see the name change. And after that, you will always see Paul. His name is Paul. And the only time anyone calls him Saul again, it's him. When he's giving his testimony about 
who he used to be. We talked about that before. Uh, he goes by Paul from this, uh, from that time forward. This is right where it starts. Verse 9. So then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at this sorcerer. Verse 10. And he said, O full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil. Yeah. Woo. Now, the first thing that I noticed right away is somebody named him son of Jesus. But in reality, he was called son of the devil. Because of what he was doing. But what I find amazing here is as we read on, we get to see the person and the calling and even the, the approach of Barnabas and Paul. You notice Barnabas didn't step up and say, you son of the devil. Why? Because as we read, we recognize Paul, uh, Barnabas' personality, the, the anointing and the, the changes that God made in him, he was called son of encouragement because he was an encourager. He was, he was courageous. He spoke the truth, but his approach was always with redemption in mind and encouragement. Where Paul, he always loved, he always had redemption in mind, but he was going to use the sword. Because how many know, as we learned last Sunday or so, that the sword is not just that weapon in the full armor where you block, you know, the, the attacks of the enemy with your, your shield. It's also an offensive weapon. It's the sword of truth where you go in to the darkest places and you rescue people from deception. You bring the truth and you, you go after them and, and, and open up their eyes to truth with the sword, right? And Paul... As we read about him, we realize that he was ready with the sword. Always. Amazing. You still with me? You still listening? Yeah. Amen. We're being faithful to God to, to go through the book of Acts. There are times when we want to preach other things. I want to share a topic. I want to do something else. But we must be faithful to go through those scriptures. Wednesdays is a dedicated time for us here at this church. Yeah. Sunday morning, Sunday nights, we do different varieties. Our home groups and and daytime fellowship, we do different things. But our Wednesday is the time we go through the verses. So sometimes it feels like school. Sometimes it feels like just some education like that. It's okay. Feed on the word. Get an appetite for it, folks. Amen. Amen. So uh, Paul says, Oh, full of, verse 10, Oh, full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight way of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time, or like a season. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand of the supper. We just got through reading the other day about some other stuff that happened in the early church. You remember Ananias and Sapphira? Yeah. They dropped dead. Remember that? And, and, and other. Uh, remember the guy who got who died and got eaten by worms? Herod Antipas the first? What we're seeing here, we don't see it a lot today. But in the early church, I have to echo it because we when we run into it, you have to realize it's there for a reason. Those kinds of judgments, that kind of power, that kind of anointing, there was a reason. And every time the, dis, the, the enemy comes in so strongly to try to destroy the foundations of the, of the church, and uh, the foundations of God's word, the, the judgment of God is, is harsh. What a powerful thing. I even think that there are some believers today who would like to have that kind of power. Huh. Curse people like that. What did you say, you heathen? <laughs> Some people want this. Not me, man. That scares me. Because I ain't no better. I'm a sinner who needs to be saved by grace just like everyone else. I thank God that we don't hear about this. I thank God that we're not all just worshiping and serving God and, you know, I say we're all here together and somebody's falsely worshiping God nobody knows but God they just dropped in the aisle. 
Come on. But imagine what that would do to a church. Yep. Come on. Come on. Come on. Imagine what something like that would do to a church. Some of you are thinking, well, it would empty it out, wouldn't it? <laughs> 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 I'm not going to that church. No. What it would do is it put godly fear on people. We stop playing games and start saying, I'm going to take God seriously and I'm going to give him my whole heart because God's not playing with me. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, he's like verse 32 or 33, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. God is also loving, merciful, gracious, but he is also just and holy. And we don't play with him. And gosh, that makes me shiver when I think about all the mistakes I've made in my life. God, forgive me. Anybody feel that in your heart? God, forgive me. Have mercy on me. Amen. All right, one more time. So let's keep going here. Uh, so this guy, for a season, I, I find that pretty interesting too because here we see it immediately. God put the dark mist on him and he can't see for a season of time. We don't know exactly how long, but the beautiful thing is it wasn't forever. I don't always understand how God does what he does. All I know is God is in control. And it was only for a season. Verse 12. Then the proconsul, this Sergius Paulus, believed when he saw what had been done. Think about it. So he's right there. His buddy was all, I don't believe these guys. My leader for these dudes. Man, these guys are wrong. You can Keep listening to me. They're bringing false teaching. You need to listen to me. And, and, and Sergius Paulus, he's right there. He's looking. He's listening. And all of a sudden, Paul steps up. And says, you son of the devil. You know, you, don't you ever stop? And then he, you're going to be blind. The guy goes blind. Imagine Sergius Paulus. Well, I guess I know who's right. I guess I know who's talking the truth. How, how would he know? It's right there in front of us. Because there was power there. Paul, later in some of his letters, said, I don't come to you with eloquent speech, but I come to you with true demonstration of power. When you and I walk right with the Lord, God's power will be on you. You won't be able to control it. It won't be, you know, you walking around like Clint Eastwood with, with a couple of guns. <laughs> You know, busting into places, shooting the power of God just whenever you want. Right? You hear that? Uh -huh. Exactly, that little whistle. You know, high noon and you come in and start shooting off the power of God. You, you and I don't choose that. That's not how the power of God works. You, you and I, we live uh, uh, available to the Lord. Live in, in a way that God is pleased with so that when He wants to choose you and when He wants to use you, he can use you anytime you want. Amen. And so, when you walk, when you walk in the right of God, there's nothing that says God won't use you. It's just a matter of His timing. But when we play games with God, why should He? Why would He? He will put His power on us. Think about it. And so, here he is, Sergius Paulus, he's looking around, and he believes. He realizes what's going on, and he believes. So the last thing I want to say about that is, whenever you saw supernatural workings in the New Testament, the early church, even still to this day, there's a reason why the gifts of the Spirit really are there. Yes, sometimes God will heal for the blessing and benefit of the person who's sick. How many of you know that we, we can pray for a lot of people, but it's always God's choice to heal, right? Yes, amen. So the, the main purpose is we see in the New Testament whenever the power of God hit, like in this book, in this case, was for a sign to wake people up so that they believe in the true living God. Because there were a lot of people who could, you know, philosophy, their philosophy and their way of thinking, they could sort of explain things away. But you can't explain away the power of God. And by the way, did you know this is the first time, uh, the first miracle through Paul's life that was recorded? This is the first one. 
And of all, of all the types of miracles to be recorded, it's kind of like a curse. Was it even a blessing, was it? You think Elijah saw it blessed? The first miracle God chooses to use Paul in, and it's to make someone blind for a season. I don't always want God to use me, because I don't, I mean, I want him to use me, but I'm always like, God, it's got to be your will, because because I don't, I can't, I can't call it, I can't call what should happen. God knows, amen? Amen. amen. And so, we're almost done tonight, guys, I can tell you guys are, yeah, you've had your fill, right? <laughs> and so, um, let's see, verse uh, 12 again, he believed, the proconsul believed, when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. So two things are clear here. He saw what was done, the demonstration of power, and he was also astonished by the words that were being taught, the words of the Lord. Isn't that the way everyone believes? We believe the truth and we believe what was done. Jesus rose from the dead. Amen. amen. So, amen. Verse 13. Now, when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, all of a sudden now, it's not Barnabas and Paul. It's now Paul and his party. Anybody notice the little switch? Mm -hmm. Okay. We don't take that wrong. And I think it's important to visit this because in the modern day church, people tend to be in competition. People worry about other people's authority. People worry about who's rising up and who's not. I've been here longer. I should be doing it. How come you know, this guy's barely been here a month and why is he getting to do that stuff? That is not up to the organization or the local church. That's up to the Holy Spirit. And if we, the people of God, would be humble before God, then more ministry can happen because we're not going to be, <coughs> excuse me, we're not going to be worried about who's rising up and who's not. This is what I love about Barnabas because Barnabas, the power of God that was shown up in him is a great humility, a willingness to step aside and let Paul take the lead even though Paul was a lot younger in the Lord than him. Are you listening? Yes. Barnabas took stepped aside and said, yeah, go for it. Go for it. He was encouraging. Nowadays, hey, wait a minute. I don't know if I like this. How come he's preaching, man? I've been here a long time. Well, how come I'm not preaching? I've been here a while. How come I'm not looked at like somebody important? Because it's not up to people. It's up to God. And remember, God sees everything. He sees the faithfulness or the if you're usable or not. He sees it. He chooses it. Just don't have to just speak to leadership and pastors sometimes. Well, at least I know he's spoken to me, and there's times when I'm asking God to speak to me, and he's not speaking. So I'm waiting. You still listening? Yeah. We live in that time where people are in, like, it's weird, man. There's, you know, competition. No, why would we do that? Don't be in a hurry to be a master or teacher. That's what the book of James tells us. Don't be, don't be in a hurry. Because it's hard. Because when you get called by God to do something, there's sacrifice involved. But I will say, the flip side of that coin, when God calls you to do something, you better make the sacrifice. Because it's not man calling you, it's God. Amen. And so, Paul and his party sailed for Paphos, they came to Perga they, in Pamphylia, and John, John Mark, remember the assistant? Remember the servant? The nephew of Barnabas? Does anybody remember him? Yes. Does anybody care? Yes. Yeah, thank you. I got to you. Know, one house of God, where the God is being preached. Amen. Amen. There you go. There you go. Amen. Amen. I have to get that water bottle out of that. I got one right there. I'm kidding. Oh, man. And John, in verse 13, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. So what we see is Barnabas and Paul, and it's Paul and his party. And as they're doing God's work and they're moving, the, the one that God called to assist to help them, to, to support this minister and ministry, 
departs from them. It goes back to Jerusalem. Now I'm going to tell you one thing and we'll close with this tonight because that's about it. The Bible doesn't actually tell us why John Mark left. It doesn't tell us. There's a couple of ideas, possible thoughts. One, we think his mother was a, a widow. And so maybe he missed his mother and went back home. There are other people who have other opinions. Like this opinion that it's possible he didn't like the change. His uncle was in leadership, and all of a sudden this, the leadership switched, and now it's Paul. Because what's the next thing that happened? On the next mission they're supposed to go, I'm out. These are just opinions, people's opinions. And it's possible. But we really don't know what his reason for leaving was. But let me tell you what we do know. Whatever the reason was. Good, good intentions, kind act, loving, you know, in his homesick, whatever the case. As we continue to study, this is what we're going to find out. Paul looked at him as a deserter. Whatever the reason was, and it could have been a good intention, Paul looked at him and said, that guy is a deserter. That guy is not profitable for this ministry. This guy is not trusted. Are you listening? Amen. When we study the word, we find out that's how Paul looked at it. And it caught my attention. And we'll get there when we get there. But that caught my attention because that makes me realize that when God calls you, okay, even if you have a good reason why you stop walking in your calling, it doesn't matter if it's a good reason in your mind or anyone else's mind. If God's called you and God didn't make the change and you made it, then guess what? You might be, not with me or anyone else, but by the Holy Spirit. You might be looked at as, you're not in your position. You are not, you're, you're in a deserter's position. And it's looked upon as unfaithful. Now, how do we know that God approved of Paul's opinion? Because remember, Barnabas, he's the encourager, the uncle. Right? Yeah, I bet you he's not... He's not worried about John Mark. He's like, no, no, he's fine. But how do we know that God supported or, or, or proved of Paul's opinion? Well, from this point forward, the scripture seems to follow Paul. And little by little, Barnabas sort of disappears. And John Mark, and later, later on, we see God brings them back together. And Paul says to Barnabas, and the others, bring John now. Because now he's matured, he's grown up, now he's profitable for the ministry. Mm -hmm. And we see the reuniting, we see the reconciliation. But at this moment, there was a clear, deserting immaturity. And folks, it's because it's the Word of God that I'll preach that to you. We don't, God needs to be the one to decide, not us. Amen. 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 And so, John departed. He left. We'll stop right there. That, that was verse 13. We only got to 13 verses. <sighs> All right. It's okay, though. It's okay. That's the food we need. Amen. <laughs> Folks, the Word of God needs to get into us. We need to get an appetite for it. We need to understand what we're, what we're believing, what, what we're embracing. We're in the end times. And how can you and I go and rescue anybody, our sword, the sword of the word that we carry, and not but a little dagger? Maybe it's a little plastic knife in, the, in, those, in those boxes, fork knives. You know what those are? Yeah. A plastic butter knife. You go to. Folks, we need to grow in God's word so that we can be used of God more than ever, more than ever. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the early church and their